um, predominantly IP and Gareth will be much more knowledgeable in this area than I am. Um, but just as a quick overview, we'll be covering um, trademarks, copyright, data and patents, which is all very exciting. And if you've just joined as well, um, feel free to post in the chat what industry you're in, just so Gareth can have an understanding of, of where you are if you haven't already done that. And um, really exciting um, and very generous of Gareth. Uh, he just told me just before that um, he is op uh, offering a, a complimentary consult to our community for anyone who fills out um, the self-assessment worksheet which I'll post the link in the chat in a moment. Um, and so feel free to fill it out as you go today. Um, and Gareth can explain a little bit more about this um, and to email him at the end um, with the worksheet. And so, yeah, today we'll go for um, one hour until 2 p.m. and then we'll wrap up at the end as well. So I'm gonna throw over to Gareth and can we all just give a nice round of applause and over to you, Gareth. Thanks so much, Paz. Uh, it, it's great to be of service to uh, the RMIT Activated community. In fact, it marks a, a bit of a uh, anniversary of such. Um, I've, about three years ago, I did my first talk with RMIT on legals and entrepreneurship. And since so I've de uh, delivered something very similar to a few different faculties, but most importantly, to the entrepreneurial community of which we're all part of. In fact, it's great to have Chloe on the uh, on the call. We've been all on that journey as well uh, through her 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 startup um, or business, thriving business, and basically um, many others on the call. I've had some sort of engage engagement with. In fact, I went through RMIT Activator as part of the lockdown for an for my own social uh, social entrepreneur uh, project, uh, which is uh, still in development around education. So. Um, yeah, while I am a practicing IP and commercial lawyer, I have definitely had a firm foot in education the last few years. And so it's great to be building bridges between industry uh, and education, which I see out of all of the 41 universities that are in, in Australia uh, that, that RMIT does the best. And I can I'm quite proudly say that having been a lecturer for RMIT for a little while. So look, um, let's begin the, sh uh, the, the presentation today and if Max or Paz has the opportunity to, to do the slide share from their desktop, um, that'd be great. If not, I'll just yeah. sort of flow with things. Um, there is, uh, Paz has that, the, the slide deck. Um, it's just, I'm, I'm actually communicating to you from a, a, an iPhone today. Regardless, um, what I would encourage you to do at this point is just to open up the link uh, that's been provided with the worksheet. It's a two page worksheet. And it actually covers, I believe, the most fundamental information for any startup enterprise uh, to know about intellectual property. It can serve to you as a guide and it's also a worksheet so that you, while we're um, actually progressing through some of the, uh, the different forms of intellectual property, it can serve you to actually highlight where that actually lies within your own business. Uh, and the link in the, in the slide, uh, the share link is coming through now. I encourage you all to open that up. It's just two pages and there's ample room there to actually make notes in the couple of different sections that we'll cover today. And I will emphasize, while, I, while you will get the, the fundamentals and the building blocks of IP from me, at the end of the day, it's how much you can apply this information to your own business idea. And it's absolutely pivotal, I believe, because it is actually about the asset or the property the intellectual property that you are growing for your business. We are now undeniably in uh, the digital age, the fourth industrial revolution, which began really um, 26, uh, 27 years ago with the advent of just one small thing called the internet. Now this uh, age of digital just disruption has created incredible uh, challenges and opportunities. And one question I have for you all, just to uh, kick off today, is um, a question. Who believes from the RMIT Activator uh, community believes this is a challenge or an opportunity? Perhaps just a few answers in the chat box. Who believes that with the digital disruption uh, that is occurring to us, even through these COVID times, is a challenge or an opportunity? 
a few responses if you don't mind. <laughs> okay, Dan says challenging opportunity both. An opportunity to manage, says Mark. Uh, a, a huge gift and an opportunity, Tim says. Great, great, great. In fact, you guys have all nailed it and clearly you are entrepreneurial because that's exactly uh, the a a answer. Well, there is every answer available to be creative and digital disruption is both a challenge and an exciting opportunity. And none of that, uh, much of that has yeah. occurred, can occur for us all in this time, these challenging COVID times. So where does that begin? It begins with a fundamental understanding of what intellectual property is. If you've all got the workshop open, then I'm just going to use that as the for, for, for our um, presentation today. The, um, but if you feel like, Paz, you want to add, add the, um, the slides to a link, you can put them in the chat box as well. So let's, let's begin with the definition of, of intellectual property. Uh, it is defined by the World Intellectual Property Organization as an area of law which enables people to earn recognition or financial benefit from what they invent or create. So in other words, it is a product of the mind of the intellect. IP Australia also defines intellectual property as a creations of the mind or intellect that can be legally owned. It allows for the protection through patents, trademarks, copyrights, and designs, but as uh, design circuit layouts and plant breeders rights. But at the end of the day, it is the product of the mind and intellect it is a product of your own intellectual capital. Everything you have been working on for many years or, or more on in your own business. And the simple fact is in that in here now in our fourth industrial revolution, we're gone are the days where the predominant value of a business is known as in accounting standards as plant and equipment. These were the days of the third or the second industrial revolution where factories fueled conveyor belts, which built big business and industry. These were powered by machines. The fourth industrial revolution, what we are living through now is powered by ideas. And therefore the sheer value of your business and your, uh, is your ideas. 80% of it will be your ideas. Whether you know, it does not matter if you're a tech giant like a Google or a Facebook, um, or uh, even a, a consulting business, 80% of your assets will now be intellectual capity, capital or intellectual property. And that's why the, the, this kind of understanding, I believe, is a fundamental building block for you to build your business or enterprise. It's the foundation of your business or your enterprise. And what I'm going to take you through today is three big areas, three areas, three areas in which we will cover um, of just registrable rights. Um, and what you should understand about this is we're not matter, no matter if we're talking about data, which is going to be big business in the next 10 to 15 years, if not already, um, trademarks, patents, copyright, all of these things are genuinely known as a bundle of rights. And intellectual property is a bundle of rights um, which exist in your business. And what you can see in the worksheet there is an overview of what the different rights which make up the bundle are, okay? Oh, oh and fantastic. Let's start with trademarks because uh, Max has actually found it right there on, on the front page there. Um, so let's begin with one understanding of the trademark because this is the most visible form of uh, intellectual property available in your business. A trademark is a name, designation or logo that is used to identify a brand, product or service. It's used to brand the product and service, and it is basically defined under the Trademarks Act 1995 as being uh, the opportunity to create a, uh, a registrable right uh, around your badge of origin. And what that essentially means is your brand. How many of you on the call, just perhaps a thumbs up or like, um, have already chosen a business name or been running with a business name for quite a few years? How many of those, I'm just because I'm looking at you all now, how many of those people have registered a domain name, for example, on top of that? Okay, well, the, the, the simple fact of the matter, are we still there? Uh, it's just one of the first things that actually a business owner does uh, is they actually register their domain. 
And one of the big furfies that I'll actually share with you here today is that most people think that because they have the domain name, because they have the domain name, they have actually protected their business name and their brand. They have not. Basically, only a trademark affords legal protection. The legal protection uh, to protect your business name, your brand name, um, and badge of origin as a badge of honor, origin capable of distinguishing to all others in the marketplace. And this is one of the fundamental first things that I believe a startup uh, uh, should do. They should be on the searches for domain names, availability of those domain names under their name. They should also consider when is the right time to register that as a trademark. Um, and I think that's really, really important as, as you grow your business. Uh, for example, Curate Space, and it closed on the call. We registered her trademark uh, quite a few years ago now while she was on the pathway to growth. And, and by the time she had opened her doors in Melbourne, uh, she had actually had that as a registrable right. Okay. And the, the luxury that she has now is that she has that for 10 years. And that's what registering a trademark will allow you to do it'll actually it's a small investment for the protection of your brand in the Australian marketplace and the good news is once you have you registered your trademark in the Australian marketplace you can then leverage it internationally uh, utilizing um, a treaty called the Madrid protocol which basically the Madrid protocol allows you to register in up to 115 different countries um, that, it, uh, that uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization administers. And once registered in your home country, you're able to take it abroad, okay? So that is what is a trademark. And many of you, here's a quick question for you actually, whoops, uh, maybe let's move to the next slide. Um, but basically trademarks are not only about your individual name, they can be collective. And many of you be familiar here with, the, uh, uh, with this symbol. It's a collective trademark for Australian made. It was very popular in the 1980s. In fact, um, there was great pride for its use. Other collective trademarks include uh, winery regions. Uh, uh, winery regions also often have collective trademarks. That's why champagne can only be uh, used for wines that are designated in a certain region of France. And okay, that's why we have sparkling wine here in Australia. There's quite a famous case in Australian trademark law around champagne. Uh, they, they sought to prevent uh, winemakers in Australia from using them. B Corp is a fantastic example. Thank you, Tim. Yes, B Corp is a collective trademark that once you have fulfilled their um, requirements, um, to be established as, as a, a B Corp, a social enterprise, then you may use their collective trademark uh, in your uh, terms of trade. Okay. Um, now this gentleman here, just the next slide, please, Max. Um, the power, this is the sheer power of trademarks. Many of you would probably know this gentleman here. I'd be surprised if you didn't, maybe just to make sure that you're um, uh, that, that we don't have anyone off the page. Who is this gentleman in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, um, on the slide here. Um, you'll probably get no marks for, for getting it right, but of course it's Mr. Sir, Sir Richard Branson. Now, Richard Branson has from the 19, thank you, Tim, has since the 1960s, has since the 1960s actually uh, been uh, aware of the power of trademarks and, and has built a very, very significant trademark. He has a very powerful personal brand but they should not be confused with his business uh, trademark, which is Virgin. Okay. Now, many, uh, for those on the call, when you register a trademark, there are actually about 45 different uh, classes of goods and services in which a trademark can be registered. So it's really important to ensure that the categories or subclasses for registration are accurate. But um, Richard Branson uh, has benefited from the power of his own trademark because I did, a, uh, I did a search recently actually, and he has up to 115 different trademarks registered in Australia in all, you know, in, in an incredible wide range of subclasses, music, airlines, boats, space, all of these things and areas 
uh, testimony to the power of uh, Branson's trademark. In fact, he has leveraged the power of this trademark for his own benefit and for the business benefit because of its because it's so recognisable. He's able to leverage into new industries, and that is consistently what he does. He, he turns uh, he turns businesses he, he sees opportunities in new industries, and he is able to enter those industries earlier. Um, and uh, because he, he has a, a very strong and powerful brand, which is protected by a trademark. So um, let's move on now to other areas of IP protection. But before we do, and perhaps just note down on the worksheet, if you can make notes through, uh, I know if you're opening in your Gmail, you can, uh, there's a PDF, uh, uh, the, the Doc Hub PDF uh, application, which is built into any Jeep. Gmail allows you to actually open a PDF and make notes on it. So there's a little tip for you. Um, you can make notes here, but and if you, if not, write down, please, for me, what your trademark would be. And that was the first, one of the first steps on the, uh, on the worksheet. Where, what would your badge of origin be? Is it the domain name or is it a brand that you've been working and pitching your project under? Or have you got a product in the marketplace? Um, is that the name of the product or do you have an umbrella brand like like virgin um so perhaps make a note of that because i think i, I absolutely believe uh, that in your the development of your business that it's going to be imperative for you at some stage to actually register this as a vital asset okay so moving on from trademarks um and we're going to move to the next slide please uh, if you don't mind max thank you it's just oh there's the trademarks oh yeah actually just hold on that one there is a great case uh, uh, here in that, that can be illustrated. Well, there's a trademark set 1995 is really what protects this. Just very quickly, it's a sign in business to indicate goods and services come from a particular trader or service provider. It can be a phrase, a word, a letter, a name, a signature. It can even be a colour. Cadbury have registered uh, the, the colour purple, a, a distinctive purple. Um, and I believe even uh, prints has uh, uh, registered, uh, Prince's Estate has registered a, a particular purple Pantone. Uh, so there's some trivia for you. It's everything from the, coat, uh, the Nike swoosh device through to scents, even there's powerful scents, you know, like there's the entire perfume industry that is built around distinguished, which distinguished smells, which can be trademarked. Okay, so it's very wide ranging as a badge of origin. And so this is just something to also bear in mind beyond your name. There could be other, other elements that could be uh, capable of registration as a trademark. Fashion is a great example. Just the next slide, if you wouldn't mind, um, because UG Australia is a famous trademark case. And actually, it is, it is a, this is a cautionary tale. The cautionary tale begins with a small family business that began in Melbourne, uh, which was named UG Australia. And these business, uh, Russian immigrants, actually, that came to Australia to build this business, build a product that became synonymous with Australia themselves, uh, itself. In fact, UGG uh, was so popular um, that um, it became a big problem for this uh, small business um, when an American company, a uh, footwear company called Deckers came into Australia and actually usurped the name uh, uh, UGG uh, and were served uh, a cease and desist on the, this, the very business that created these boots. Um, and um, this began a David and Goliath uh, battle, uh, which uh, lasted for seven years in the courts. And it's a cautionary tale because if this business had registered UG Australia at the very start, then it would never have had this enormous legal problem. But more importantly, it would have been protected the name for its own use of benefit. Um, the long story of, of this is that actually, after seven years in the courts, a judge ruled that these owners had brought uh, the name UG to be so popular that it, it had transferred to the common vernacular. In other words, everyone should be able to use the name UG for woolly sheepskin boots. That's the business had created the popularity, but in this case, it had transferred to the public benefit and so therefore no one could own this trademark no one could own the word ug and i tell you what the owners would have shrugged an ug when they heard the results of this case because they were, were devastated of course and this is why 
you can now uh, you, you can now see uh, are being used widely because everyone has the capability of using it. I don't want to go too far down this angle, but here in the Territory, I've been involved in some presentations around the, uh, the Indigenous flag. That's another one uh, where there's an argument to pass the public benefit. But many people may not realise the Aboriginal flag is trademarked by an artist who created it and has licensed it to a clothing company who even as recent as the indigenous, uh, indigenous round of footballs were trying to negotiate with the AFL for its use. There's a big argument for national, symbols of national identity that should pass back to the public benefit. Uh, but most importantly for you as business owners, register your trademark early to prevent others from taking your name in the marketplace. Let's move on uh, because I'm, I'm wary of time. We've got only about 25 minutes. Um, well, we're not gonna, I'll just get you maybe to go down to. And I was. Um, sorry? Is there a question there? Because the original. Sorry, or maybe it's just background. Okay. Um, look, I, I want to just touch on one or two other areas because they're on the worksheet. If we could just have Mac, the, the next slide, please. Uh, just down to designs. There's David and Goliath and Massabelle. This is a perfect place. Designs. Okay, I just want to mention all of the registrable um, rights, uh, but we're going to do, we're particularly focusing on trademarks, copyright, and uh, uh, maybe some on patents after this. But designs are worthy of mention because any of those in creative, uh, in the creative space, there's a couple of people on the call. Um, the things that we recognize about designs is that while a trademark protects the name, a design protects the appearance. Okay, so under the Designs Act 2003, a design will protect the visual appearance of a product. This could be your business card uh, through to clothing, uh, even, uh, you know, the visual appearance of products uh, could be a table, it could be clothing. Um, it's about the look, shape and ornamentation of a product. All right, so Apple, while it's got patents over, you know, its computers and software, it has registered the design of its products as well. These are the sleek 10, you know, iPhone 10X, for example. That is a registered design. It's the look, shape, and feel of a product in your hand. Um, so a design is all, sometimes a better strategy to protect, if, particularly if you're in a, a creative industry. Um, if you're creating products or services, uh, sorry, if you're creating products, then a design can be fit for you. And actually, Compared to our neighbor, neighboring registrable right of patents, it's a lot cheaper and effective to actually register a design over a patent. All right? A design will actually keep your product protected for up to ten, five years, five years for this one. A trademark is 10 years. A design will be protected for five years. But compared to drafting a patent, it's a lot more uh, inexpensive to uh, register a design. So I just mentioned that one on the way through uh, for anyone that might have products. Anyone uh, in those creative industries you mentioned before, creating products, crafts, or um, anything related to that? Otherwise, I'll just move on. Feel free to, to, to bounce a question into the chat box. But basically, as the next slide indicates, uh, designs protect the visual appear appearance of a product and not its function. That's what a patent does. Some examples could be jewelry, could be patterns on fabric, could be footwear, could be fashion items. Phone cases, handbags, lipstick, all these kind of things are, have been registered as, pay, as designs, okay? Designs we're speaking of. So um, yeah, in the worksheet, just note down, if you've got anything in your business, uh, your chocolates are exclusively designed. Okay, look, that's an interesting one. I, I love applying these, um, these broad categories to, to, to the individual circumstances, which is why I'm actually encouraging you to fill out the worksheet. Because as you go, you may actually identify you're doing what's called a preliminary IP audit of your own business. While you may think, hey, I'm in event services, you may have designed something you know, unique in the delivery of those services, which may be a design. Um, or you've got something else uh, within your business, uh, you know, that was a clothing item that you didn't realize is extremely popular as we are all, all entrepreneurs. Sometimes you discover 
um, new opportunities. And the thing is, I'd just like you to make a note of anything in your business that could be capable of being registered as a design. Um, because this actually highlights to you the application of intellectual property in your business. Um, it's protected under the Designs Act 2003. Um, and as the next slide indicates, it's where the shape, configuration, pattern and ornamentation comes in. In fact, when a registration is made with IP Australia, a description of those four key elements need to be uh, fulfilled. Um, uh, and crucially, whether it is new and distinctive, okay? That's actually even more important. It needs to be new and distinctive in order to be capable of registration as a design, okay? So let's move along, um, but, uh, or just there's a case example there, because we, I think it helps. There is a, an Australian fashion startup, TDE. Um, you know, they've now grown, uh, grown since 2011 uh, to, to $20 million in turnover by former corporate lawyers. There is creativity beyond the law. So there you go. In, in just eight years, they've built uh, $20 million out of their intellectual uh, uh, property idea in fashion. And um, they have an IP strategy. And that's really key. You know, in this journey of understanding intellectual property in your business, what I actually believe is, is most important is that you just have a strategy. It doesn't mean you have to register all your IP. If you're just in startup phase, maybe it's now is not the perfect time to register your trademark. Well, when you go, you can bet your bottom dollar by the time you're going to investors to look for them to actually fund you, um, that that's going to be very important that you have some sort of IP on your register. The reason being is like, if you don't value your intellectual property, how do you expect anyone else to? Okay, really, really important. And so you are creating assets for your business. And it's fundamental that if you begin the, the, the process of respecting your own business first by, by at least having a plan, a strategy in place to actually protect your most valuable asset, which are your ideas. And in this case, clearly uh, the daily edited TDE have done this. They have registered, um, they registered the designs, their most popular designs. Okay. And that is an ongoing process for you. They also, uh, for them, and they also are very wary of defending their, uh, their uh, intellectual property as well. Um, having design registrations in places in one, th one thing for their various designs. And I understand they're only the most popular ones they register every year. Uh, but then defending them in the marketplace is also very important. This is often when I get involved to things. Um, I, I'm involved in the uh, helping the protection of these activities. Um, but it's often only when there's a problem that public people come to say, see me. So that's why since 2015, I've been offering these se seminars to actually help and assist uh, business owners value their most valuable assets. So, oh, oh, just on that question, by the way, on chocolate, can the chocolate, can chocolate be a registered design? Well, look, look, shape, ornamentation or feel can be protected. So it is capable. Is it new and distinctive, the uh, chocolate? Well, if it doesn't, uh, if it, 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 I am sure it is original and it is capable of a design registration, but Will that be of benefit to you, commercial benefit to you, or will the will the uh, other aspects of your business um, enterprise, such as the name of the chocolate, be valuable? Possibly both, uh, but it's a really good question because is a chocolate reg capable of registration as a design? Look, I would say it's capable. Just to give context or colour to this kind of discussion, um, just this year I had a client who actually registered both as a trademark and a design, a coffin. And then the name of the business was actually around um, allowing people the autonomy to actually design the coffin that, that they, will have, they will pass, uh, you know, that they, they will go to funeral in. It might sound morbid, but she's actually been covered in the press. Uh, Jenny Barnes has been covered in the press widely. And she registered not only the trademark last expressions, 
but also the design of these caskets. And we achieved a successful design registration for her. She's an artist. She basically, she has created a very big business. And uh, interestingly enough in her story, she's also a wedding celebrant. So maybe she's got all bases covered. Um, so let's move along now and just, uh, uh, because I'm wary of time and, and um, there's TDEs, just some pictures of TDE there. We'll move along um, to patents because patents are really important to understand in the context also of um, what are registrable rights in intellectual property. And these three main ones are really important to understand as registrable rights. They are trademarks, they are designs, and now we are in patents. Now this has been traditionally big in business. You know, on the, uh, actually on Google patents, do you know you can actually search for patents in Google? Um, it's actually a great resource. Uh, and you can actually get a really good solid understanding of what's out in a marketplace, particularly if it is a new or inventive idea. That's what patents protect. Well, trademarks protect your brand, designs protect the look, shape and feel. Patents will actually protect the new and inventive use of a product, okay? Here's a couple of examples. Hats, I'm a big fan of hats, I wear a few, but basically, uh, hats are protected, Nike's protected, right? And so I think it's really important to understand that, that these are new and inventive. And when they first came to market, this is how um, a uh, business owner had actually protected their interest in it. Thomas Edison was one of the most prolific, uh, was one of the patenters of all time. And he crossed industries. It's not just around electricity, but also um, he actually laid the, had some of the fundamental IP for the cinema in, in the age of cinema. He registered a patent scope, right? And these things would provide what was called Nickelodeons. And they were, in sh were licensed out to shop fronts. And these guys actually used these as an example, uh, you know, to, to actually play the first motion picture films. Okay. And he built an incredibly uh, monopoly out of that before some other filmmakers from the West Coast of America actually said, enough's enough, you can't restrict all our creative expression. And that's how uh, one particular filmmaker went over to the East Coast of America and made a film called In Old California, which is actually the first film that was ever made in Hollywood. So this just goes to show that in patents and inventions that uh, entrepreneurs have since for a long, long time actually been building on the ideas of others. And patents actually serve to protect um, actually the new and inventive ideas of others. So let's move on to there to understand how it's protected here in the uh, marketplace. Under the Patents Act 1990, a patent is legally enforceable, right, for a device, substance, method or process. Okay, now this is not often the business plan, okay, just so, um, just so you know, it's about inventions. It's going to be a device, substance, method or process. But basically, when they're granted, a patent will give an exclusive commercial right to that invention. It'll give an absolute monopoly. And that's exactly what Thomas Edison did. It can actually be for quite a long period of time, up to 20 years. Okay. Um, however, it's really important as entrepreneurs to also understand that it's not just a patent, a worldwide patent that offers, you know, the absolute protection. There's two other patents that are worth, uh, worth knowing about and, and in fact, uh, important to know. And they are the innovation patent, which lasts for eight years, and a provisional patent, uh, which lasts up to 12 months. Often the strategy that comes up is actually a provisional patent uh, because it allows 12 months for the entrepreneur or business owner to actually explore the commercial potential of the idea. And if at the end of that one year, uh, a, you know, a, a commercial uh, opportunity can be seen, then you can actually roll that into an innovation or into a standard patent, okay? So again, that comes back down to strategy. And the most important part of this is to understand what the patentable subject matter is in your business. Okay, who can, uh, and using the worksheets now, who can identify some patentable subject matter that it may exist in their business? Inventions, otherwise, anyone got anything they want to share? 
often I've seen this come up in terms of software and it is capable of registration um, as a patent, a software. In fact, um, we have a, a patent code is a very good question. I'll get onto code when we come to copyright and data. But essentially, it can, uh, can, code is technically copyright. It can, uh, register, it can be copyrighted, it could be patentable. It has to be functionality. I'll give you an example. Um, I'll give you an example of that. Canva, Australian Home and Grown, uh, has about 25 different patents. And in investigation of those patents, uh, they're actually around the functionality. The new inventive step is, is how Canva uses um, uh, its design tools uh, and the drag and drop features that are actually incredibly intuitive. You know, this now is a big business uh, and uh, Melanie Perkins uh, has actually grown this in, in you know, under 15 years. Uh, but there's now registered in 60 countries, the trademarks, and she has 25 patents. And that's the value of an $8.3 billion business, which makes um, intellectual property important, be, uh, all important to understand in the context of what we're all creating. Um, let's move on. One cautionary tale here and the importance of patent protection. If we go to wireless, wireless lands the world. This is a story um, from CSIRO and this story, just the next slide, please, after this one. Um, it's actually a story of, of CSIRO and how CSIRO created a fundamental uh, piece of technology, uh, which is capable of, of protection. Uh, not just the code, but this, this was actually in relation to a component of a modem called a YLAN. They invented the YLAN component, which is, is, is available in any, uh, in any modem. Now, this was actually developed by a couple of inventors, um, five gentlemen at CSIRO. It's now in well over three billion devices uh, worldwide. Uh, in everything from smartphones to laptops to televisions use this technology. The irony is that it was developed in the 90s. And if we just move to the next slide, the history of this is actually a cautionary tale because CSIRO did not, um, did not actually successfully patent it initially. Uh, it was, uh, even though it was seen as one of the top 10 inventions and made it there, um, the patent case actually demonstrates that an that, that, uh, American company commercialised it because CSIRO did not patent it. This then resulted in a lengthy court dispute and again, very unhappy people. It was settled after several years and countless legal fees. But at the end of the day, it was not successfully patented by CSIRO and therefore it turned into a massive legal problem. And this had the capacity to build, build, you know, the ownership, Australian ownership of this technology could have, in my opinion, had the ability to spawn an entire Silicon Valley or tech industry here. Absolutely. You know, the ownership of that. If Henry Ford could have done it over the motor car, why couldn't we have done that with Wyland? And it all begins with protecting the most important asset with your ideas. And I can tell you, having worked for CSIRO, the appetite towards commercialization and protection of these ideas was somewhat back in the 1960s, right? Scientists, wonderful people. They create great, brave, bold steps for all man and womankind. However, they do not have an appetite particularly to, to, to protect these things. And unfortunately, it's a really important part of the entrepreneurship process. So therefore, what I'm, um, uh, thanks, Catherine. Uh, again, it means that tech is freely available and that helps reduce prices. Look, there's an argument for there, but I think uh, at the end of the day, you've got to use these things as tools, whether they're for public benefit or not. Um, they, it is very important to just be aware about, aware of, because if you're going for financing, it's essentially the property in which um, your investors are investing in. And it's a little bit like this. If you let the front door of your um, house open, how long do you believe it would be until someone came in, walked in uh, to take your plasma television screen? 
Okay. Now the answer to that might be <laughs> where you live. However, at the end of the day, putting up a barrier to entry is really important to gaining a commercial and early mover advantage. You know, so you secure your own home, then why are you not securing your own assets? All right, this is why I offer this education piece so much because I'm astounded how many entrepreneurs, let alone business owners, understand the value of their ideas. And that's why I share these stories as well. They're cautionary tales because they're actually about you being diligent with your ideas and actually cre creating commercial advantage with them, which is the name of the game. Okay. So, you know, uh, I won't go any further onto that, but anyone uh, would like to just put in uh, any patentable subject matter or have any questions on that. I really actually passing on to now the next slide, the blue slide, creating value. This is why an understanding of these three registrable rights are important because they allow you to license them. They allow you to leverage them. If you haven't protected your asset, it's very hard to then leverage it. You can do it through copyright, but it, whether it's copyright, patents, trademarks, or designs, then the commercialization process is about licensing your intellectual property. property. One of, it's a very common commercialization vehicle, uh, licensing, not selling. Who can tell me the difference between licensing and selling and what the major difference is? Anyone in the chat box? The difference is, is that you're not actually passing ownership. If you license a product, whether it's, it's, it's a, a DVD or it's uh, a piece of software, say call it Microsoft Windows, the license has an extreme value and you actually don't give away your IP, you're actually licensing it. But you're licensing that as an asset. And that's why actually licenses are more important to understand than protection. Because you need to understand what you're actually licensing. Are you licensing like Boost Juice does, his name as part of a franchise and a method and system to great value to people around the world and franchise owners around the world? Or are you licensing your idea? Are you licensing your software, right? Microsoft, are you licensing uh, an app? for use uh, for a certain period of time uh, on a subscription, right? This is where an understanding of intellectual property is really important because it informs such things as your terms and conditions and it informs your contracts with your customers. I've got clients in many different industries. One of the things I love about what I do is that I'm consistently speaking to people about their ideas. And that does not mean if you've got a passion for motorcycles and you've bought like one of my clients, a, He's invented a new, uh, a new way of actually regulating an engine remotely and providing that as a part, which he now dis is the sole distributor around the world, all from down in Mount Mornington Peninsula. Or does it mean, you know, a Norway startup that is looking to provide a broadcast service for augmented reality, which is one of my clients as well, right? All of these have ideas, but they've all in the business of licensing what they do and doing it well. Okay, some of the common terms that come up in a contract. Now we're moving from sort of registrable rights to contracts, because commercial contracts and IP, they go together. And any business owner will need to consider if they are licensing, whether those licenses are exclusive, non-exclusive, okay? Exclusive licenses don't serve you very well unless maybe you're, um, you know, the, uh, a, a shake in Dubai and paying big, big dollars for that. You want to give non-exclusive licenses wherever you can. So people are repeatedly coming and using your intellectual property and you've got a license for it. Subscription services, a great example of these because people pay for access, say for a month, you know, maybe it's a membership to use Canva, uh, or pro Canva and, and that's a license for a month to pay fee to continue to use the service. This needs to also be considered around the territory. Are you like a coach, like one of the most highest paid coaches in the world, such as um, Brad Sugars, who has basically licensed his entire coaching program into a franchise model um, where people will have to pay a fee to then be a coach or a consultant to uh, use his, uh, his IP? Um, or are you, and you're selling off countries like the US, Australia, these are the, the capacity, this is the capacity of highly sophisticated intellectual property commercialization 
vehicles, selling off territory. So you're the exclusive provider of that intellectual property. It's, it's can be part of, part of what, um, what they do, what, how businesses grow. Um, we need, you need to know the limitations, time limitations, expiry terms, where payments are made. Um, what are the rights of the, uh, you know, IP user? Can they come to you for advice? Can the, the licensee come to you to consult further on a monthly basis? If so, how much hours? All right. These documents, these contracts are really, really important when you've kind of um, protected your intellectual property because they actually regulate how you get paid. Okay. And that's the name of the game. It's the commercial vehicle that goes alongside your intellectual property. And I would suggest every business owner will need to have to consider at least having some standard terms and conditions on their websites quoted when they quote customers and they engage with them and pay them an invoice. That's essentially a contract in which some sort of terms and conditions need to be in place in order for you to effectively grow your venture. Um, now we're only, we're entering sort of like the last five, 10 minutes. So I just want to kind of give a quick overview. Um, just going through now of, uh, also this last section called copyright. I often start with copyright, but I wanted to go, cause you guys are entrepreneurs. I wanted to kind of cover the three registrable rights on the worksheet, which are, uh, trademarks, designs, and patents. And of course, licensing is at the end of the worksheet, which is really about leverage. But I'm kind of like dealing with copyright in the context of today at the end here, because we're entrepreneurs and also copyright exists almost in everything. Uh, it's an automatic right, right? It's the bundle of economic rights, which gives owners exclusive rights. The difference between copyright and the other areas is that it actually is a, um, or it's, it's on protection. It's, it's on your creation. So if you're a designer, there's some examples here, actually just flicking through. And it doesn't matter if you're a fashion designer or in software development and you're developing code, um, these are capable of copyright protection. Copyright and contracts often go hand in hand, and that's where your licensing terms and conditions are really important. But I also mentioned it if we just flick to the blue slide here, the third slide here, because I think as many more and more business owners, and I'm seeing through Activator working in software and tech, it's also really important because it's a hot topic, just the blue slide. Uh, so I think it's the third one in this, in this set. Um, it's around privacy and data protection, okay? Really important area and growing area uh, because we are seeing businesses are predominantly, sorry, that's not really large, but I'm going to read this out. There's five things you need to know about data and privacy protection. But firstly, it's the copyright in a business and you have an obligation as a business owner, if particularly if you're in software or otherwise now to actually be de dealing with people's data and privacy effectively. It is enshrined in the privacy act 1988. And just so you know that anyone with a website or a business needs to have some sort of privacy policy in place. And that goes back to 1988. That's since been fettered by a ruling called the GDPR ruling, which came out in 2018. And it means that anyone with European customers, and it's actually, I can cite this as a trend on where we're going in the area of data and privacy, that you need to have a policy in place in how you help handle your customers' information. More and more, we're seeing business owners hand over things online, and now a business um, has, to, has to have a, a policy in how you deal with your customers' data. And, how, and you to need to inform them what you're doing with the data. Okay, this was a big important step. It stops the Facebooks of the world and also just taking all your data. They need to inform you how they're going to use it. It's why we also have these long and exhaustive terms and conditions which you sign up to things. However, it's really important in the future because of the way technology is going. You need to understand how you're dealing, if you, particularly if you're a tech business, how you're dealing with personal in, information and you need to ensure that you've got some sort of uh, policy in place in how you deal with uh, data. Data is copyright and data and copyright is can be business. When you've got 80% of a business, which is all data driven, that's the copyright in your business. And to answer a question that came up before, in the US, right, is capable of registering copyright and you can actually register your code as copyright which actually I believe every Australian startup should consider doing because I'm dealing with just to give some color to this discussion and one final case study, 
I've got a client at the moment that developed a, a, an app called Rewind in 2012. And this app provided a service of basically doing uh, back and forth movements. We can probably, a uh, back and forth movements um, it, with a, with a video, video rewind feature. Only one year later, this app appeared in the app store under the name of Instagram Incorporated and had the name Boomerang. This client of mine that was built in Melbourne, another cautionary tale, they had built the, the app. They had, it's actually really, the website looks fantastic. I think it's www.rewind.com.au. I'll have to get the website. Anyway, it's it really slick. Anyway, and it's still there. They'd never registered the trademark. They did not register the code. They did not register any part of their intellectual property. And in 2015, as a little bit of a, um, a kick in the face, an app called Boomerang arrived. Why do you think they called it Boomerang? With the same symbol, infinity symbol, that is still in the app store today. Rewind, Boomerang. Same functionality, same, same badge of origin, different names. However, regardless, it is now recognized and has been recognized in the world press that Instagram or Facebook baits this application into the Instagram feature and now it has been used for over six years and built a substantial value to the Instagram business. Another Australian story. And we are actually looking at the litigation opportunities of this business opportunity. So the opportunity for redress around their intellectual property. But guess what? It's made more difficult because they didn't register the code, they didn't register their trademark, they didn't register anything. And that's the problem uh, that, that business. So this is a couple of things that people can absolutely do. I, I don't have time for the case study, but I want to finish up here just on the last slides. So you can find more information about this, all these different areas. Um, just let's go right down to the end for more information on these different areas. You can visit ipaustralia.gov.au. There's a really clear and some great resources there on the difference between patents, designs, trademarks, particularly those areas. Um, and I think it's really important that every business owner on the call does, does, does themselves the favor of actually understanding, just understanding what these areas mean and how they apply their business. And just in closing, I'm very happy to assist. Um, it's been a pleasure to present today to RMIT Activator Community a community I'm actively involved in myself as an entrepreneur and business owner outside the law. But most importantly, um, you're only confined by your ability to leverage your own intellectual property and to do it well. That's it for me. Thank you so much for having me today. Amazing. Thank you so much, Gareth. Lovely virtual round of applause. Um, uh, wow. Thank you so much. Like, as I said, we really appreciate you coming in and sharing all of this wisdom with us and despite all I'm glad that everyone got to lap up and hear from you as well and um, just before we go I'd love for everyone just to post in the chat just one thing you learned today one thing you enjoyed um, this would be really nice for us to see as well for Gareth as well to see um, anything that resonated so while you guys are popping in the chat it's now um, a bit of a summary of, of one thing you learnt and perhaps well, while the, while you, while the away, yeah go for it yeah and no, just just a reminder that if you feel and i always give people this opportunity if you really feel like you're on that hero's journey of of your idea and you really want to spend the time to I, I think over your intellectual property i will spend more time with you um if you go pay me the um this the service of, of actually filling out the two pager um because i think that's really where the value is is in the application and this information to your own idea okay so but i'd love to yeah no thank you and thank you for the thanks that are coming through if there's anything 80 percent of your business is it uh, ip uh dan that is very very uh very good observation that's absolutely right right so it's known as goodwill for a good reason uh because your mm. ideas are your most very valuable assets in this day and age in the fourth industrial revolution so it serves you to have a roadmap of how you're going to protect, most importantly, leverage them for your own uh, financial 
and uh, and for your own benefit. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and um, yeah, and and cheers to everyone popping in those things in the chat and. Um, just before we wrap up, I just wanted to let you know about our next Lunch and Learn, which uh, follows on very nicely from this one. And on Tuesday, 6th of October, so the coming Tuesday, um, we're having our next Lunch and Learn with our legal counsel at RMIT, Beck Torp. And Beck has been um, involved in our Activator community for a couple of years now, supporting a lot of startups with IP and legal advice. And she also just ran a lovely info bite yesterday with the launch hubbers. So she'll be providing a different perspective on Tuesday um, and sharing more um, about legal and IP following on from this. Beck is a legend. She has a way of with words and I'm really excited for her to come in on Tuesday. Um, and so that brings us to the very end. Um, also just shout out to Max for sharing the screen and helping me and everyone here today. I don't think this would have carried on without you. So I really appreciate that. Um, and Gareth will be sure to send you the recordings and lovely comments in the chat as well. And that's it. Thank you everyone. Feel free to unmute, say goodbye, say your thanks and we'll see you soon. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Gareth. Bye. See you later. Thanks guys. Cheers, thank you. Gareth, you can stay on if you're still here. Oh, he's gone. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, right. Max. No problems. You don't need anything from me now, do you? As in... <laughs>